Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever asked that perhaps in your mind? Perhaps you're out of business and then you just kind of see it disorganized and chaotic. Perhaps you're at an eating establishment and, and things are just not going the way they should go. Perhaps you're working in a business or a company and it seems like they just can't get it together. Things are just not going well and you, you kind of ask yourself and you might even ask out loud, who's in charge here? Who's running things? Things seem to be out of order, out of control. They're not what they should be. As we look around at the world around us and we see the things going on in the world, sometimes that question is asked, who's in charge here? When we see bad things happening to good people and good things happening to bad people, people we see people who are trying to live right and they have a hard time and difficulty in their life and you see people who don't care about righteousness and it seems like everything goes well in fact they seem to be prospering who's in charge here job was asking that question in the book of job who who's in charge here He got that answer in Job chapter 38. And when you come to the book of Revelation, that question is being asked by the Christians who are being persecuted by the Roman Empire. They have been promised a better life in Christ. They have been warned that persecution was going to be a part of that. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus gave a double blessing upon those who were going to be persecuted. For righteousness sake. For his sake. And yet, everywhere they turned, it seemed like they were facing difficulty, hardship, tribulation, problems, because they were Christian. And perhaps they were asking the question, Who, who's in charge here? It seems like that the wicked are ruling Where is God in all of this? We're looking at the behold statements that are found in the book of Revelation. We're looking at that word as it's found within the context of this book, the book of Revelation. And last week as we started this series, we talked about how the word behold means to look upon, to gaze upon, to fix your eyes upon something. We have been looking at the various places that the word behold is found in the last book of the Bible. Some 25 times the word behold is found in the book of Revelation. After giving a message to the seven churches of Christ in Asia Minor, there in chapter 2 and chapter 3, commending some, rebuking others, calling them to repentance, calling the faithful to remain faithful, In Revelation chapter 4, we begin a new section of the book in which we are launched into a dramatic presentation of visions to show forth God's power, God's majesty, using symbolic language to show, yes, the enemy is strong, yes, the enemy seems to be conquering, but ultimately the enemy of God's people will be defeated. The first couple of beholds that I want to look at this morning from Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. John writes, After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now you put yourself into the situation of those early Christians who were being persecuted by the Roman Empire. Every door on earth was being shut in their face, as it were. 
Their opportunities were closing. But John sees in verse 1 of Revelation 4 a door standing open in heaven. A door in heaven was open to them. Access to heaven was open to them. Doors were being shut on earth. They were finding problem after problem and persecution after persecution, difficulty after difficulty. But the one who truly mattered was open to them. Access had been granted. The door had been open to them in heaven. You think about when Jesus died on the cross. You think about how in Matthew chapter 27, as it talks about the death of Christ, that in the physical temple that was there in Jerusalem, that huge thick veil was ripped from top to bottom. That was a symbolic gesture on God's part on a physical temple and a physical veil to show that access had been granted into the Holy of Holies through the death of Christ. The door is standing open in heaven. What an encouraging thing that must have been for the Christians to know that they were in prison. Quite literally, a door is locking them in because they were followers of Christ. They couldn't get an audience with the emperor, but the one who ruled the universe, they could get an audience with him through Christ. The door was open in heaven. And that voice said, come up here and I will show you things that must take place after this. Verse 2 says, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 2, that John was in the Spirit and behold. He was in the Spirit, that means he was under the miraculous guidance of the Spirit in writing these things and in seeing these things. Behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So the first thing we learned that the door was open in heaven. Access to heaven is available to God's people. Verse 2 tells us that we are to look upon that in heaven and see that it's not just empty. There is a throne that is set in heaven. That means power, authority, rulership. Not only is there a throne there, but there is one who sat on the throne to show forth the majesty of the one who was sitting on that throne. Look at verse 3, Revelation 4 and verse 3. He who sat there was like a jasper and sardis stone in appearance. There was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like emerald. And around the throne, verse 4, were 24 thrones. On the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. The crowns that they had were victory crowns. was not a diadem crown. In the Greek it was Stephanos, the leafy garland victory crown. Those who would uh, participate in the Olympic Games would win that garland of victory. These are depicting victory with their golden crowns on their heads. And in verse 5, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunders, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, most likely representing the Holy Spirit. The significance of this is very strong. The fact that we see here that every door had been shut to the Christians on earth, yet the most important one, the door had been opened. Access had been granted. They in their despair, they in their tribulation, they in their problems and persecution could still pray to the Father through Jesus Christ and get an audience before the one who sat on that throne. You know, we see something very similar to this 
in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. Where Isaiah is permitted to see the throne room of God. He needed to have that message as well because it was a message of encouragement. Isaiah chapter 6 beginning in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim. These are spiritual beings. Each one had six wings. With two He covered His face. With two He covered His feet. And with two He flew. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. The posts of the door were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah was permitted to see this vision of God. And John is seeing this vision of God. They are crying out in Revelation chapter 4. Those spiritual beings. They are crying out Revelation 4 and verse 8. Holy, holy, holy. Just like you find in Isaiah 6. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They're worshiping and praising God because He is the ruler of all things. You see, that's something we need to be reminded of because sometimes life isn't fair. Sometimes life isn't fair and things go bad to good people. But we have to focus on the things that are important, and realize that God loves us enough to grant us access to His throne room anytime. If we are His children, and if we're seeking to do what's right, that we have access to God anytime, no matter what we are facing. And that's the message we take from this in Revelation chapter 4. Behold, a door standing open in heaven. Behold a throne and one that sat on the throne. Who's in charge here? God is. God is. And the rest of the book of Revelation is making the promise, yes, you're going to have to suffer for a little while, but the enemies will be destroyed. They will be. That brings us to Revelation chapter 5 in which we find two more beholds. Revelation chapter 5. Beginning in verse 5. Revelation 5 and verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loosen its seven seals. I looked and behold... In the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. We're still in the throne room of God in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 4 brings us into the throne room of God. Revelation chapter 5 continues that and zeroes in on a particular one in that throne room. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1, to get the context of these behold passages, John said, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, that would be God, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. These are the plans of God. Sealed with seven seals, completely sealed with seven seals. Important documents in the ancient world would have a wax seal placed upon them. Only one who had authority to do so could break the seal and open up the document. Only a person who had the authority to do so could do that. Verse 2, Then I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? Notice the strong angel with a loud voice wasn't worthy. 
He wasn't worthy to do it. And he asked the question, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? Who can break open those seals and open up the plans of God and carry them out? Verse 3. No one in heaven and no one on earth and under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Wasn't even worthy to look at it. Verse 4, so I wept much, John did, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. And here's the good news. One of the angels said to me, do not weep. Don't be sad. There is one who is worthy. Behold, look upon the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and loosen its seven seals. Now we know that this is talking about Jesus. He is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Lion represents royalty, represents power. He is a powerful ruler. He is of the tribe of Judah, and he is the root of David. David, according to the flesh, was the ancestor of Jesus. But Christ, as the Son of God, was the source of David. He's the root of David. You see, Jesus was both God and man. Two natures in one person. So He is the source or the root of David. He's also the descendant of David according to humanity. He has prevailed to open the scroll and to loosen its seals. Now, when you go back to the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, you see a promise that God makes to David about a thousand years before Jesus was born. Promises that one of his descendants would become ruler. That his throne would be established and he would rule forever. That prophecy is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. Now, David was of the tribe of Judah. He was of that tribe. So that's why Jesus is called the lion or the ruler from the tribe of Judah. Among those 12 tribes of Israel. You know, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 14 tells us, It is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood, In the context, they're dealing with the fact that Jesus was not going to be a priest on earth, but he would be a priest in heaven as our mediator. Not going to be a priest on earth, but in heaven he would be priest. And so Jesus is part of this grand scheme, this grand plan, and he has prevailed, he's overcome to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. He is the only one who is authorized to do this. No human on earth could do it. No one dead, no one living, no angelic being in heaven could do it. Not even the strong angel with a loud voice could do it. Only the Son of God could break those seven seals, open up that scroll and carry out God's plans. Then we come to the second behold in this section. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. I looked and behold. Now remember he was told that he is a lion of the tribe of Judah. But look at what John sees. In the midst of the throne and the four living creatures. In the midst of the elders. Stood a lamb. As though it had been slain. This lamb had seven horns and seven eyes in this symbolism, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Seven being a number of completion. Seven horns indicating rulership, complete rulership. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, before he ascended to the Father, all authority. Those seven horns, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
John chapter 17 and verse 2, He has authority over all flesh. And number 7, along with the horns, indicates that symbolically. So he's told, John is told, to look the line of the tribe of Judah. But when he looks, he sees a lamb as though it had been slain. That indicates the death of Christ. How did he prevail so that he might be qualified to open the scroll, break the seals and open the scroll? He prevailed through his death. That's how he became victorious for himself and for everyone else that follows him. He is that lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's also the lamb of God. John chapter 1 and verse 29. And through his death, he became victorious for himself and for all. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, because in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. He appeared as a lamb that had been slain. He was slain. He was crucified. He is the one that is worthy to carry out the plans of God that were concealed in that scroll. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Jesus is the light of the world. He is the one who has brought about the plans of God. And he is the only one, because he has prevailed, that can break those seals and unleash God's will in the world. Behold that God is on his throne. Behold that Jesus Christ, his son, is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb that was slain. Who's in charge here? God is. His son is ruling as king of kings and lord of lords. He prevailed because he was slain. He was slain for our sins. He was slain and his blood was shed so that we might prevail. So that we might overcome. That we might come over and live with God for all eternity. So if you want to escape out of the troubles and the difficulties and the wickedness and the darkness of this world, you're going to have to get right with God. You're going to have to obey the gospel and follow Christ and be obedient to Him and be faithful unto death. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Then you will ultimately escape from all of these things that are all around us. God is still ruling in the kingdom of of men. Have you submitted yourself to Christ? Is He Lord of your life? That's not just a slogan. That means something. That means He rules everything about you. That He is the center of your life and all that you do and all that you say and all that you think. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, believe in Christ, confess Him as the Son of God. Repent and be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll be saved. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16 and verse 16. You see, a person can't be saved before they're baptized, not according to the Bible. 1 Peter 3.21 tells us baptism does also now save us. So if you understand that plan of salvation, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, and the Lord will add you to His body. Not a denomination, but to His kingdom, the church. And if you've done that and you've gone astray, you're not faithful to the Lord. You've turned your back on the Lord. Repent and come back to Him, and He will forgive. As always, the choice is yours. 
while together we stand. We sing.